Okay, so get ready to put away those spreadsheets and stock tickers for a bit, because we are diving into the really interesting world of Wall Street. Um, not talking numbers here, though. We're talking biology. Biology on Wall Street. You better believe it. Yeah. We've got selections today from John Coates' book, The Hour Between Dog and Wolf. And uh, let me tell you, it's going to change how you think about market booms and busts. Oh, I love that book. It's fascinating how Coates just drops us right into the middle of the trading floor to like unpack the biology behind those super high stakes decisions that they're making. Yeah, it's not just about the numbers, is it? It's about what's happening inside those traders' minds and bodies. Yeah. Like, like they're elite athletes, right? Exactly. Having to make those split second decisions. Right. But instead of aiming for a gold medal, they're going after millions and millions of dollars. Mm-hmm. And their bodies are reacting in that same way with all those hormones surging, yeah. affecting every choice. Yeah. And, you know, one of the most fascinating things that Coates points out is testosterone's influence. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Particularly during what he calls the hour between dog and wolf. Okay. Hour between dog and wolf. Now, that sounds a little ominous, giving like werewolf vibes. What's the science behind that? So picture this, right? A trader scores this huge win. Okay. Testosterone spikes. They feel invincible on top of the world, and then they win again, and testosterone goes up even more. It's this feedback loop. So you've got a win streak fueled by your own biology. That's kind of crazy. And that's what makes it so dangerous. This surge can lead them to make reckless moves and ultimately, you know, disastrous consequences. Think of those traders in the movies who, like, bet it all on a hunch and lose everything. Yeah, it's not just a game. Exactly. All right, so testosterone's a biggie. But I'm guessing it's not the only hormone at play on Wall Street, right? Not even close. We have to talk about adrenaline, too, or as it's known in science land, noradrenaline. Okay, noradrenaline. You know that feeling when you are, like, laser-focused? Your senses are heightened, like you could hear a pin drop? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Like, right before you have to give a big presentation and your heart's racing. That's noradrenaline, getting you ready to react quickly. And on a trading floor where prices are constantly fluctuating that quick thinking is mission critical. Yeah, so it's like having your finger on the pulse, ready to react at any given second to those sudden changes. Precisely. It lets traders cut through the noise, process everything instantly, and react to those market shifts in a flash. Yeah. But there's this other piece of the puzzle we haven't touched on yet that often gets overlooked. Okay, so we've got testosterone making them risky, adrenaline keeping them on high alert. Yeah. What else is going on in these traders' brains? Have you ever had like a gut feeling about something? Even if you can really explain why. Oh, all the time. Like when you decide not to trust someone, even if they seem totally fine. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Those gut feelings aren't just some mystical intuition or whatever. They're actually rooted in biology, specifically in the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve. I feel like I've heard of it, but I'm drawing a blank on what it actually does. Mm -hmm. Basically, it's this like hidden communication highway between your gut and your brain. And in those intense trading situations, it comes in to regulate your fight or flight response. It's like a brake pedal. So even when your adrenaline's going crazy telling you to freak out, the vagus nerve says, hold on a sec. Exactly. And it's amazing. Seasoned traders, the ones who've been doing this for years, they seem to almost develop a sixth sense for the market, partly because of a fine-tuned vagus nerve. So it's not just about reacting in the moment. It's about recognizing patterns, those subtle signs that most people would totally miss. Exactly. Coates compares them to chess grandmasters. They've trained their brains over years of experience to recognize the patterns, anticipate the market's next move. I can see why experience is so valued in that world then. Yeah, it's not just about learning the rules. It's conditioning your body and brain to react the right way at the right time. And a big part of that is recognizing those subtle patterns. Okay, so you're saying there's a biological reason why some people are just good at trading. It's not just luck or something. Exactly. Take something like the dead cat bounce, for example. Dead cat bounce. That's a thing. Yeah. it's it, This term traders use to describe a really brief recovery in stock prices after a sharp decline. Mm -hmm. New traders always fall for it, thinking the downturn is over. Oh, I've heard of that. <sighs> Didn't know it had a name, though. And that's why it's so dangerous, right? Yeah. But seasoned traders, they can spot those patterns because they've seen them happen over and over again. Their brains have been conditioned through experience to pick up on those subtle cues. So it's like they really do have a sixth sense. Almost. But how do you think that develops? Is it just a matter of time or are there specific things these traders are looking for? That's a good question. What do you think? I think one of the biggest things is learning to read the mood of the market. And I don't just mean looking at the numbers. Yeah, but like, what does that even mean? Okay, so imagine a stock that's steadily been climbing for weeks, 
But then suddenly there's this massive surge in trading volume, way more people selling than buying. Uh oh, <laughs> sounds like a bad sign. Exactly. A skilled trader would sense that shift in sentiment, that change in the market's mood, and they'd react accordingly, even before the numbers fully reflect it. Wow, so they're like emotional detectives. Reading between the lines, the data? Kind of. They're not just processing numbers, they're interpreting signals. This is already making me rethink everything I thought I knew about finance. It's not just about the numbers, it's about human behavior, psychology, hmm. and now thanks to John Coates' biology. Right, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. Coates goes on to explain how this super complex relationship between biology, psychology, and market forces can lead to those insane booms and busts we hear about all the time. Right, okay. So we've got testosterone driving that risk, adrenaline keeping everyone on edge, yeah. and the vagus nerve trying to keep things under control. And we talk about how people can train themselves to read the market, but what happens when things go south? That's when it gets really interesting. Because just as these biological forces can lead to success, they can also amplify our failures sending us down this spiral of stress and bad decisions. But we can unpack all of that after a quick break. Okay, yeah, let's take a quick break. We'll be right back. Okay, so before we dive into the dangers of all this testosterone and adrenaline, let's back up for a sec. We were talking about how these powerful hormones can make you feel invincible, laser-focused, mm -hmm. which on a trading floor makes sense, but like too much of a good thing can backfire pretty easily, right? Big time. And that's where our friend cortisol comes in. Ah, cortisol the infamous stress hormone. The one and only. You see, when those risky bets fueled by all that testosterone don't pan out, or the market just takes a sudden left turn, that's when the stress kicks in and cortisol levels go through the roof. Okay, cortisol. We all have it, it's a natural thing. Mm -hmm. But on a trading floor with those insane stakes, I imagine the stress is off the charts. What's that kind of chronic stress actually doing to a trader's body and brain? Imagine being in a constant state of high alert, week after week, month after month. That's life for a lot of these traders. And over time, all that cortisol can really do a number on the brain, especially on a little part called the hippocampus. The hippocampus. Now that rings a bell. Wasn't that something to do with memory? Ding, ding, ding. The hippocampus is basically the memory center of your brain, crucial for forming new memories and digging up old ones. But here's the thing. Prolonged exposure to cortisol can actually shrink the hippocampus. Wait, shrink? You're saying stress can physically change the structure of your brain? You heard right. And a smaller hippocampus means your memory takes a hit. It's harder to learn from past mistakes, make sound judgments, like trying to navigate a maze with a half-faded map. Whoa, that is a scary thought. Yeah. I mean, we all know stress is bad, but to think it can actually damage your brain? And it gets worse. Chronic stress can mess with your focus, your decision-making, even your sleep. You become more susceptible to something called learned helplessness. Learned helplessness. We touched on that earlier, but can you remind me what that is exactly? Basically, it's when you've tried everything to fix something, but nothing you do seems to work. So you just kind of give up. Pretty much. Yeah. You doubt your abilities, play it way too safe, and you start missing opportunities because you're so terrified of messing up again. In finance, that's pretty much game over. Yeah, it's like the polar opposite of that testosterone-fueled confidence we talked about. Exactly. And it becomes this vicious cycle. The stress hormones that are supposed to help you in small doses, they actually end up setting you up for more stress down the line. So it's not even just the financial losses. It's how our brains and bodies get hardwired to respond to those losses. Which makes you wonder, are some people just built to handle that kind of pressure better than others? You know, that's a great question. And it's something Coates looks into in the book. Mm -hmm. It turns out some people do seem to have this biological edge. They're just naturally more resilient to stress. So like they have some kind of internal defense system against the bad stuff. Something like that. Their bodies are just better at regulating cortisol preventing those extreme highs and lows. Which makes you wonder if we could figure out what those biological markers are. Could we use that to create a better work environment? Not just in finance, but anywhere. People are dealing with insane amounts of pressure. That's an interesting question. And it raises some pretty big ethical questions too. Definitely something to think about. So we've got testosterone, adrenaline, cortisol. Talk about a hormonal roller coaster. Mm -hmm. But what's the takeaway here? Can we actually manage these biological forces that seem to control so much of what happens in the markets? That is the million dollar question. And Coates argues that by understanding these biological factors, we can design systems that are more resilient, less prone to those wild swings we see all the time. So you're saying it's not just about individual traders and their own biology. It's about the whole system. Exactly. Like 
Code suggests that having more diversity on trading floors could help a lot. Okay, interesting. What does diversity have to do with it? Well, research shows that men and women tend to approach risk differently, partly because of those hormonal differences we were talking about. So it's not about saying one is better or worse, but having a mix of approaches might lead to better outcomes overall. Right. And it's not just about gender either. Imagine a trading floor with a mix of seasoned vets and brand new recruits. So you've got a range of experiences, temperaments, different biological responses to risk. Exactly. It's like a natural ecosystem. The more diversity you have, the more resilient the whole system is. I like that analogy. Yeah. So what you're saying is, even if we're not all traders on Wall Street, this knowledge is still relevant to our everyday lives. Absolutely. Because those gut feelings we talked about earlier, the ones driven by our vagus nerve, those aren't just for traders. Right. We all get those. Exactly. And what Coates is saying is that we should be listening to those gut feelings more instead of just brushing them off as irrational. Interesting. Yeah. But how do we actually do that? How do we start to trust those gut feelings? Mm. Especially in those really high stakes situations. Well, for one, we need to learn to pay more attention to our bodies and what they're telling us. And that's something we can talk about in more detail after a quick break. So we were saying that we should pay more attention to our bodies and what they're telling us. But how do we do that in those moments when the pressure's on? Well, for one, we can try to be more mindful of how our bodies react in different situations. Like pay attention to your breathing, your heart rate, those little gut feelings we talked about. So it's like learning to read your own internal signal. Exactly. And the more you do it, the better you'll be at understanding what those signals actually mean. Makes sense. So we can use this to avoid making bad decisions, but can we also use it to actually be more successful? 100%. Like, think about testosterone for a second. We talked about how it can fuel your confidence, but also lead to reckless moves. Right. So it's about finding that sweet spot. Exactly. And knowing when you need to maybe take a step back. Interesting. And on the flip side, we know that too much stress for too long really messes with your memory and your decision making. So it's important to prioritize taking breaks, letting your body and your mind recover. Yeah, we don't always do a great job of that. We wear stress as like a badge of honor. Great, but we need to treat our bodies better. If you're constantly stressed out, you're not going to be performing at your best. Very true. Well, this has been fascinating. I never thought I'd learned so much about myself from the world of finance. It's pretty wild, right? Even in a world of numbers and algorithms, biology still rules. It all comes back to biology in the end. It's a good reminder that we're not just making perfectly rational decisions all the time. We've got hormones, instincts, gut feelings. And the more we understand those forces, the better choices we can make. Couldn't have said it better myself. Well, that's about all the time we have for today's deep dive. But I hope you all learned something new about the hidden forces at work behind those big financial decisions, and maybe even a little something about yourselves too. 